Right, step number six. Step number six is once you've actually acquired the property. So guys, if you need any help in terms of acquiring the properties, you're stuck. I mean, that's what your postgraduate support is all about. You can phone our office for absolutely anything, okay? So don't feel that you're going to be left in, in, the, in the dark in that regard. Okay, so what step number six is, it's the process of actually now going and getting development approval for your structural renovation. If you're doing a cosmetic renovation, you can skip, skip step number six entirely, okay? So, but still, I want to teach you this stuff because at the end of the day, you might be starting out as cosmetic renovators, but at some point, I guarantee you'll end up structural renovators. Okay, now just so you know, the terminology differs on a state-by-state -state basis. In New South Wales, development applications like council approval is called a development application. In Queensland, it's called a development application. In Vic, it's called, in, called a building permit, okay? So if you go to Melbourne and you say a development application, most people, um, may, you may get some funny looks, okay? In South Australia, it's called a town planning permit, and in WA, it's known as a development application. Again, you would think it's called all one consistent thing right across the country, but that would be too hard. Okay, for the purposes of this workshop, I'm just going to call it a development application so I don't have to keep repeating myself 50 times over. Okay, never ever renovate without permits. It'll be very tempting just to take some shortcuts. Look, in all honesty, um, you know, I have taken some shortcuts over the years. Sometimes you've got, I'll give you an example, you might have the back... Um, I, I, I grabbed it the wrong way then. Um, you might have at the back of a house, you know, a door, just a normal door, and you, know, you want to come through and you just want to slightly enlarge in the door a little bit, okay? Um, that you can get under exempt and complying development typically, but at some councils will make you do a full development application for that little door. So I say just use common. I'm not flouting, I'm not telling you to flout the law in any way, shape or form, but I'm just saying use common sense as to what you can and can't do in properties. So try and avoid renovating with permits because you will, without permits because um, you will... Um, at some point come and start. Now, in, in, uh, in each state, there are government bodies that regulate the whole planning process. In New South Wales, it's the Department of Fair Trading. In Queensland, it's the BSA, the Building Services Authority. In Melbourne, it's the building, the Victorian Building Control Commission. And the South Australia, it's the Government of South Australia. I've missed one, wherever I missed. And Building Services Authority in WA as well. So if you get stuck, there is help at your disposal in each of those states. Okay, the Bible of Councils. Many of you yesterday, did anybody not see the LEP DCP? I've said this around a few times and it's still not going around, so I'm going to find this, I'm going to pass it around. But as I said, this is the Bible of Council. This document has all the ins and outs of what the side setbacks are, height setbacks, um, building line zone, um, colour schemes, heritage overlays, all sorts of things. So it is worthwhile for you as professional developers, renovators, to go and buy yourself a copy. You can go and download this free. Every single council has their LEP DCP free on the internet, but when you print it out, it ends up being like two or three hundred pages. Um, you can, look, you can certainly do that and go and bind it yourself. I just find it better just to go to the council and actually buy the pretty copy of that. So can we please pass this around and make sure everybody has a quick flick through it because it is an important document um, in your own individual suburbs. It just means that you can start to know what council do and don't like. And when you walk into a property, you know that certain streets have a 900 mil setback and so forth off the boundary. This is the process of council. First of all, you engage a professional, and, a, and I'll talk about all the professionals involved in the development application process. But first of all, you engage a professional, you work out your vision in terms of what you're going to do to the property. You've then got the actual design process where you do your architectural drawings on the property. You then architect, once they do their design, they'll do their architect architectural due diligence. So your architect has to look at the side setbacks, the height controls, the building line zone, the front setbacks, all that sort of stuff. It then goes into council for formal council approval. And then, it, then once you get formal council approval, it then moves to what's called a construction certificate application. So what we're going to go through today is we're going to go through that whole process from start to finish. Okay, these are the consultants that you're going to need for your development application. Remember when I first started um, on Saturday morning, I said you're going to need two teams. Can you remember what the two teams are? Suits and the tradies. So you've got your trade team and you've got your consultant design team. And this is, we're at the stage now where you're learning about your consultant design team. Okay, 
So these are all the people that you're going to I'm going to skip through that slide. I'm going to go straight in because I'm going to itemize all of these individually. The first person you need in the process, when you sign that contract of sale, first person you're going to call is the surveyor to get the development application, app, development application survey done. Your architect or your draftsman really can't do any formal drawings until they've got all of those measurements of the neighbor's height, ridge heights, all that sort of stuff. They can start tinkering around with their, like, their pencil drawings, but they can't do formal computerized drawings until they've got those survey documents. Now what you need to do, the whole process for a surveyor normally takes about a week from the time you say go to the time you actually get the electronic document back on your computer or into your architect's office. Um, in my experience the surveys typically cost um, somewhere between 850 to 1500 depending on what state you live in. Okay, and how complex the property, obviously the bigger the property, the more expensive, so there's variables in that regard. But if you work on that average figure, um, that's a good benchmark to work from. Um, now what you're asking, there's all different types of surveys. I'm actually going to do a, a video on this actually, the different types of surveys. As I said, I could make this a, I could really make this a three week workshop if I really wanted to with all the levels of everything. So I will try and keep doing these weekly videos of, of things I can see that you should know about. So there are lots of different surveys uh, for properties, but the one that you are asking for is a development application survey. They quite often refer to it, um, the technical term I guess for surveys, it's called a level and detail survey. So what you need to say is you need to say to your surveyor, I need a level and detail survey for a full development application. Make, please make sure you say everything I need for a full development application. Because if you don't say that, they may come out and they may not take certain measurements and may miss a few, and it'll be that few that they miss that the, your architect needs to complete the architect's drawing. Guess what? They have to go back out, they have to set their tripods up again and get everything aligned, and they will charge you half the fees again to go out and take one tiny little measurement. So you don't want to stuff up in the survey. Um, Quite often the property boundary is inside the boundary line. When you find that out with a survey, is that something you would be likely to um, avoid doing a development on or leave for someone else or would you just negotiate with someone to change, move the boundary? Are you saying when the neighbour neighbour's um, boundary is encroaching on yours? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well. They're encroaching on your land. That will come up in the in the purchase. I mean, that will be notated on the survey in the contract of sale. So that'll become an issue there. So um, I would either be getting that rectified, or the neighbour should be paying for my piece of land that they're taking. That's compensation. Um, okay, so what will happen is the surveyor will come out on your site, they'll basically take all the measurements, the boundaries, they'll come and they'll look at, they'll take the measurements of where your neighbour sits in relation to your house, where your fence is, they'll take the neighbour's ridge heights, all those sorts of stuff. They need all of that detail for when your architect calculates like the overshadowing and the sunlight, they need all those sorts of measurements. So that process takes about a week from start to finish, so you need to factor that into your occasions in terms of your time frames. Okay, town planner. A town planner is a person that basically, that Bible that's going around, that's their job to be, they're an expert at that Bible. They know all the ins and outs of the town planning, the side setbacks, the height setbacks, you name it, they know about it. On one of my early projects on the heritage listed site, um, I knew that that project, I wanted to subdivide the land and build a new dwelling and I knew it was risky. So what I did is I engaged a, two town planners because of the value of that property, two and a half million dollar house, I didn't want to get that wrong. So I engaged um, two town planners to come out and a heritage consultant to come out on site as part of my seven day due diligence period and to give for, me, for them to give me answers as to my likely chance of success of getting that through. Now they said to me, Sheree, you've got a 95% chance of of actually winning in court. They said to me, you, have, you, you will have to go to court, land and environment court. So I knew that within a few days of signing that conditional contract that I would have to be, I would be up for, ex, for some ex, expense in the land and environment court. That's fine, I knew about it. I factored into my feasibility. That was 100 grand. So um, your town planners will basically help you with any planning requirement. Now, I haven't had to use a town planner too much in the past. Your architect really, 
knows what a town planner does, but a town planner just is is more knowledgeable than an architect, I guess, more skilled in all those little loopholes and ins and outs of the development control system and your um, planning system in your local council. So they're just an expert there to help you with any planning issues in any way, shape or form. Okay, and they're charged by the hourly basis. So most town planners, again, it, it varies depending on where you are in Australia, but an average fee would be anywhere between $150 to $450 an hour, depending on how good they are and where they're located as an average. Okay, draftsman. A draftsman is a person who can basically do architectural plans. An architect, a draftsman uh, is different to an architect. A draftsman really sometimes referred to as a building designer, um, quite often just draws drawings. So as renovators, what you can do is if you can go to an architect with a concept, so you might be doodling with your tracing paper and you say, look, this is what I'm thinking, you can actually take that to a draftsman and they can formally draw it up on CAD for you. So CAD is just the computerised architectural drawings. A lot of draftsmen don't even use CAD these days. They still do it by hand. So they're getting few and far between. But drafts, my, in my experience, draftsmen, you're not paying for all the architectural vision and the wow factor. So if you're on low budget, um, you're doing a low budget, you know, low budget reno, maybe you're buying a house that's $400,000 that you're going to convert to say a $750 or $800,000 structural reno. The last thing you want to be doing is going to an architect and basically paying 20 grand for DA fees on a lower budget property. So I have a general rule, if it's a lower value property, go to a draftsman. If you're starting to notch up into higher value properties, then use an architect. And I would deem a higher value property some, probably something from about 700,000 onwards, probably warrants the, um, the services of an architect as opposed to a draftsman. You do definitely get a difference in the quality. Um, just from my experience, even looking over my students' projects um, from time to time, I do notice a big difference in the quality of a draftsman versus an architect. They just don't. An architect has the ability just to put the wow factor and make things look more architectural, whereas a draftsman is a basic drawing service, okay? So just make sure that is a, which way you go has to be appropriate to your property. Okay, your architect. Your architect, as I said, will be the one that thinks about a whole range of things, the wow factor, you know, the, the architectural space, the planning, all sorts of things. Um, we'll get a local Sydney architect, Melissa, up shortly to have a talk to you about that. But basically what they will do, they'll handle the whole process from start to finish. A draftsman can also handle the whole process. They do exactly the same as an architect, but there's just the creative vision isn't quite there in my experience. So an architect can basically, um, in first instance, will create a concept scheme. They will give that to you. Um, they will require a brief from you in terms of what you're expecting for the project. So in my very first renovation, I made the mistake where I gave them a budget. I'm uh, sorry, it wasn't my first. It was I think it was my second or third or something like that. But I gave them a budget and it was a tight budget. It was like $150,000 structural reno. And I came back with literally a box and I was like, what's that? That's like so boring. I could have drawn that. I could have drawn that line myself. And I said, well, that's what you're going to get on your budget. And I said, you know what? I said, that's like so disappointing. Um, I said, start again. And so my mistake early on was that I gave them a budget. All right. So then I said, assume there's no budget and just produce the best architectural plan you can and I'll work out how to build it. So, you know, materials, the type of materials you use adds a lot to the cost. So, I found that it was better not to give my architect a budget and just say, look, produce the best concept scheme you can and I'll work out how to build it. Because what I do is with my architect, even to this day, I only get them, I only engage them to, uh, well, for me, I only engage them for the development application process. I even do my own CC these days. Um, so you don't have to go through the whole process. With an architect, you can take it from design, like concept, design application, like the submission package. You can get them to do the construction certificate application. You can get them to project manage it for you all the way through the process. But the more that you have an architect involved, the more money coming out of your back pocket as a renovator. So I want to keep some of that money in my pocket. So I only ever engage them to DA stage or at worst case scenario, CC. Most of you will engage them to CC, but you'll definitely, after a few projects, be able to do your own CCs. That's fairly easy as well. So I found that by doing that, I got a much better, arc, like the, the creativity wasn't stifled by not giving them a budget. What, I've, what often happen, happens was, I guess the, the issue with architects, um, not that they have any issues, but um, 
what I found from my personal experience as a renovator is that they work on a lot higher construction budgets as, as architects and builders than what I would as a renovator. So my architect used to always come out on site and say, Cherie, how much did this cost you to build? What was your project cost, your construction budget on this? And I'd always say, Steve, you tell me how much you think this cost me. And he'd always say, oh, about 650000 And I'd go, 380. He go, what? I don't know how you do this. And how I do that is because I negotiate, negotiate, and I do all these other things to try and keep ramming the cost right down. So that's the issue I found with architects is that they'll work on a much higher construction budget than what you can do as a renovator or if you project manage your own builder. So that for that reason, I decided that I wouldn't give them a budget because I'm more interested in having the best layout. And then I can change, I can down spec my materials to basically bring it down to the budget. So that's just some personal experiences of mine that I found work better for me as a professional renovator. So they can do the whole process from start to finish. Okay, um, so definitely a big difference in quality between a draftsman and an architect, okay? So one just has one, you just won't get the full creative vision, whereas you will pay, um, you will pay an architect for that vision. Architects fees range, uh, we'll ask Melissa this question when she comes up, but obviously um, mid-tier you know, properties are going to be a lot cheaper. Um, for me, I'm buying properties around the million dollar mark these days, and normally my DA fees with the architect that I use um, tend to be anywhere between fifteen to 25000 on a $1 million house, unrenovated, okay? So that's an idea. If you, if you're, I know that with Melissa, I think, um, and I'm not sure if you're mic'd up, Melissa, but say on a $700,000 house, what's the average DA fees? Well, say a house oh, at 600000 oh, Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, about $700,000. Um, often I work on an hourly rate to keep the client's costs down. So it, um, it could be about ten to 12000 for that DA. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, also, with, uh, with your architects, Melissa's just raised a great point. I remember I said to you, uh, I may have said this to you, I may not, I will certainly say it to you this afternoon, set number seven, but always work on fixed price. Okay, so um, you don't. Uh, so thank you for that. I know a lot of architects, Melissa, work on an hourly rate, uh, but for me as a professional renovator, I always work on fixed price. Okay, as a renovator, it doesn't matter if it's your architectural fees, uh, whatever your trade fees. Aim for fixed price wherever possible because you don't want any grey matter. In my experience with tradies, when you're when you're negotiating, you're, you're you know they're working for you on an hourly basis. They just become slower. They drag it out, and suddenly that's how you're going to blow out your renovation budgets. So you need to aim for fixed costs wherever possible. So you can go to your architect and you can negotiate a fixed flat rate for your development application from start to finish. Is that correct, Melissa? You've got clients that negotiate fixed rates? Oh, yes. I, I usually work on a fixed rate. But yep. um, sometimes for DAs, there are unforeseen problems after the DA sure. is lodged. And so yep. there's often extra fees. Yep, absolutely. After that, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, interior designer. An interior designer is something, I know we've got a couple of interior designers in the room, yeah? Um, beautiful. So interior designers basically, maybe I should get you guys to tell what you do, um, basically look at all the colour schemes, they look at the spatial um, feel of a room, so they come and look at the size of the rooms. Quite often an, an interior designer can review the architectural drawings and, and work out what can change to give that the wow factor. So they just look at the whole design, colour schemes, materials, furnishings, all sorts of things. Now a great way to save money as a renovator is you may not have the luxury of being able to afford an interior designer designer so what uh, sorry an architect so what you can do a great way to save money is to have a draftsman and an interior designer working together hand in hand so for me if I wanted to take a shortcut with my projects I would engage a draftsman where I'd pay five you know with draftsmen you'll probably pay somewhere between three and a half to six thousand dollars on average for a set of architectural plans again lacking the creative vision in most cases um, and then you can hire a, an interior designer, pay them three grand, five grand, whatever it may be. There's 10 grand, so the two work hand in hand. So you can spend 10 grand with a draftsman or an interior designer, or you can spend 20 grand with an architect. So that is just another little shortcut, um, just a little way that I've learned over the years that, you know, if you've got a tight budget, then get the two working together. 
All right, basics consultant. These days, um, any building that basically gets designed, it has to comply with basics. What basic is, it looks at the natural cost flow of ventilation. Um, just uh, any building that gets developed these days, um, local government departments and generally in the world, they want to, to consume less natural resources, so less energy. Um, so there's a big focus on natural ventilation and just less use of power full stop. They don't like air conditioners um, that absorb more electricity. So what they're trying to do is, you know, you'll notice that louver windows are sort of come back in fashion now being used in a lot of architectural buildings. Have you noticed that? Certainly um, my, my project that you see tomorrow uses a lot of louver windows simply for basics. So when architecture Architects and draftsmen design buildings now, they have to design them in a way that it just basically means you know, got a lot more cross flow ventilation, a lot more natural lights, you don't have the lights on. So um, things like more glass, more windows, louvers, all sorts of things are being used. When your architect or your draftsman designs your drawings, before your application gets lodged in council, they have to now send it to that new consultant, which is called a basics consultant. The basics consultant will look, after the, look over the whole architectural plan and they will give it a ranking, a score, as to whether it passes, it complies or it doesn't comply with the requirements of the basic rules, okay? If it doesn't comply, like if, it, if your house is not energy efficient enough, what they do is it, it gets sent back to the architect gets sent back to the architect and then they basically, the architect's got to tweak it to make it comply and then it goes back to the basics consultant, they check it again and if it passes, boom, you're done. The basics consultant, again, ranges anywhere between $650 to $1,000. Would that be right, Melissa? You're probably closer to it. Yes, that'd be right. But with the smaller jobs, um, I, I do the basic certificates myself, so I'm just working Great. on that certificate while I'm doing yep. the design work as well. So it depends if you really need to go to a separate consultant. Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. Thank you. All right, a landscape architect. A landscape architect looks at the landscape, at the garden, basically. Um, councils want less reliance on water with droughts and things like that. So councils particularly love it or will, will give you no option but to use native plants. Um, we all know that tropical plants look lovely, but councils love native plants. So they want you to plant um, plants that don't absorb water. That's the reality, that look after themselves. So you've got architects who look after, who specialise just in drawing the external gardens. Now, again, landscape architects can be very expensive. You don't want to go crazy. I've never really spent much money at all with landscape architects. In fact, my architect does the landscape drawings as part of their services. I'm sure Melissa does this every single day of the week as well. So um, they just really concentrate on that external. So you can't, if you're doing a big structural renovation, don't think you can leave the grounds, the external grounds out of the equation. You can't. It has to be all part of your development application. Okay, Heritage Consultant, this is the $2.5 million house. Nice house, isn't it? That was haunted, that house. I was glad to sell it. Um, yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, so a heritage, a heritage Consultant comes out and they look at any sort of um, buildings that have building overlays, um, heritage restrictions, heritage covenants, all that sort of stuff. So they'll just come back. And it's really interesting. The, I reckon these guys who do these heritage um, jobs have a really interesting job because what they do is they actually search back in the history of the property. So when I did my development application for this house, I had to get a historical search on the property and they basically traced this house, I think it was back to like 1860 or something like that. So one of the original founders, we actually found out that this was one of the very early houses in Balmain. It's, it was a waterfront house in Balmain, so it sat right on the water. And then over time, it's just been sliced and diced and carved up and distributed. But it was one of the original founders of Balmain who actually lived in this house. Um, do, you have, do you want me to just go off on a quick random story? Um, and it, like you're probably thinking I'm a bit nutty, right? But I'm not. I'm, I'm perfectly sane. Um, I, I don't really believe in ghosts and things like that. I never have. Um, I just think it's all a bit crazy stuff. And uh, I had my girlfriend um, came. She rang me up. She said, I'm, you know, I'm going to pop over and say hi. And she brought her friend. And I didn't know her friend from a bar of soap. And her friend um, walked into the house. And like it's quite a large house, as you can see. And she walked into the house and she started going like this. And I'm thinking, oh, who's in my house? I've got some widow in my house. And anyway, I sat on the lounge, made him a cup of, cup of coffee and all that sort of stuff. And I sat on the lounge. I was talking to my friend and making small talk with my friend's friend, who I didn't know from Borough Soap. And she kept doing these really weird facial movements. Like she was just going... 
and I'm, oh, I'm going, nutter in my bed, uh, lounge room. And he went, I'm like, and she kept doing it. I said, are you right? And she goes, oh, no, don't worry about me. I'm just, I'm just talking to the spirits. So I'm like, what? <laughs> and, um, and she goes, your house actually has a lot of spirits in this house. And, I'm like, and then by this time, I was getting like really um, like freaking out. And she's, because I'm scared of things like, like the unknown. And, she, and she's like, and she goes, just a second. Like I saw her, she goes, just a second. And she's going, and I go, well, what are you doing? She goes, I'm actually just talking to the spirit behind you. And, <laughs> and needless to say, I jumped off that lounge like an Olympic hurdler. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Anyway, she goes, just a second. And like, she's like, doing all these weird stuff. And she goes, there's a man behind you. He's telling me that his name's William. And I'm going, uh, yeah, what else? And uh, so then I wanted to know everything. And then... Um, He's gone, there's this, and there's this other man, he's standing over there in the dining room. They're telling me, like, they, they used to do business in this room here, because it's like, you know, quite a big grand house. And he's like, doing business. I don't know what his name is, but he's saying something like, Greg, Greg, Greg's coming through. And, and he's saying, there's another guy, there's another guy out in the garden. He's like, telling me he's the gardener. <laughs> and, um, and he died in this property. I'm thinking, oh, God. And, and then he, and he, she's going, but he didn't die, like, die of a physical disease. He died a broken heart because his wife died an hour early. And, he said, and, she, and like, it was actually nighttime when they popped over, so it was pitch black. And, and she goes, have you got roses in this garden? Because he's telling me that he planted all these roses as his symbol of love to her. And my whole garden was full of roses down in this whole section through here. Like this, this property went all the way down here. It was all full of roses. And I'm going... Anyway, and then he's saying, then your dog, he goes, you have a dog. And I, I go, yeah, well, it's obvious because like running around. Anyway, and she goes, there's a little boy, the little boy telling me that um, the upstairs on this, it was like a three-level house, upstairs on the second level, have you got an area under your stairs? And I actually had like a little, um, like a little, you know, divot sort of thing under the stairs. She says, that's where the little boy always got punished by his parents and sent to that corner. And my dog always sat in that location. Anyway, I was glad to get rid of her, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I honestly thought she's a cuckoo, right? Anyway, I had to, as part of my development application, I had to get this historical search done from the heritage consultant. And when the historical search came back, it listed all the owners, like the history, that one of the owners was like William John Balmain. And then, and then his solicitor on the title searches, when all the old title searches came through, his solicitor was Gregory and Sons. And I was like, oh, it just makes the hair on my arm stand up. So anyway, yeah. Heritage consultants can be fun. So there you go. <laughs> okay. These are the so they're the main ones that you're going to need for your development application. These are the ones that you're going to need for your construction certificate application. I've just covered the consultants required for the development application process and what you want to do is you want to now have a separate um, group of consultants for what's called your construction certificate application. Now most people don't realise there is a construction certificate application. When you actually get development approval, that is approval to build the actual building, you then need construction certificate approval, okay? Permission to actually start construction. So there's two layers there that you need to be familiar with. Very, very different. A lot of people do get the DA application, they think that's it, ready to start work, and it's not the case. All right, so the team of people that you're going to need for your CC application, you've just gone through council, you've basically got your plan stamped, happy days, party time, you can build your building. But what you need to do is now get some other documentation together before you can actually build the building. One of the consultants that you're going to need is what's called a structural engineer. A structural engineer is primarily concerned with just the structural nature of the house. So what they do is they've got some structural engineering drawings here. What they do is they pretty much, well, that's, my lip, that's where my lipstick top went. Um, I was scrounging around here going, where is it? caught my dress. Um, so what a structural engineer does is basically does drawings like this. I'm going to pass these all around so you can, um, so please don't make sure, don't take a liking to them and keep them. Um, but basically what they do is they draw these sort of concept drawings where they work out where the beams should go, where all the loads of the house are and so forth. Now it takes a structural engineer, so they'll come out to the property um, sometimes, primarily they will look at the architectural drawings, so they'll look at all the rooms, the spans of rooms, how long a room is will depend um, how Sorry, if a room is a larger room, you know, a six metre open plan room, for example, they're going to calculate all the load bearing calculations that that beam must have in every particular area of the property. So I'll pass that around. 
happy reading. That's guaranteed to put you to sleep, that one. Um, so now structural engineering drawings takes a, take approximately one to two weeks from start to finish. So when you get your development application approved and you need to go and get your CC prepared, get onto your structural engineer sooner rather than later because you don't want to leave that to the very last thing in your CC process. On average, depending on where you are in Australia, your structural engineering drawings will cost you anywhere between 3000 to 6000 on average, okay? So a big chunk of money out of the feasibility for your professional. That's why you've got that 3% professional consultant's fee. Okay, hydraulic engineers. Hydraulic engineers are primarily concerned with water. Um, they basically work out how all your stormwater pipes flow. When you press your toilet, where does the water flow? How does it basically get in and out of the whole house and basically out onto your side, okay? So what they do is they come in and design all the gutters, the down pipes, the stormwater detention pits, any underground lines, all of that sort of stuff. Again, like your structural engineer, now <laughs> these ones are really, you need to like a university degree to work these things out and like don't do your head in trying to work them out, but like certainly read over them. So what they do is they just look at all the cross flow of water. So if you look at this plan, you're going to be dealing with lots of plans. I don't know if, any, if you can all see this or not, but what they do is they have all these arrows and what the arrows are indicating is the flow of water right through your property. Because if they don't get this right, so it's mainly looking at levels, all of the... Um, Downpipes and gutters have to basically have like a slope, a slight gradient on them so water falls the right way. If, if they don't get that right, then water's going to start coming out of your toilet and all sorts of things. So you'll engage a hydraulic engineer. So your architect or your draftsman will send these to your uh, hydraulic engineer that you appoint and they will then produce some drawings. So if I can give that to you and they can make their way around, that would be great. Pass some around this way. There's some duplicates of different versions. So I'll pass those around so you can have a look at them as well. So um, what they'll do, like a structural engineer, they take approximately one to two weeks as well. So at the same time, engage a structural engineer and also engage your hydraulic engineer at the same time, okay? Because they will take one to two weeks to get those drawings done. Your hydraulic engineers will cost you anywhere between two and a half to... Four and a half thousand on average. That's a typical range depending on where you are in Australia and also how busy they are as well, okay? All right, soil testing engineer. Remember, as part of your due diligence, I taught you that some sites you're going to be dealing with are going to be contaminated material. Do you remember that? Okay, so the person who will come out and test your site for contamination is what officially known as a soil testing engineer, more commonly known in the industry as a geotech, okay, geotechnical engineer. As I mentioned yesterday, what they do is they come out to your site, so they test for contamination, basically toxic contaminated soil. They will come out literally onto your site with a big corkscrew, and as I said, they will drill down. So quite often, if you've got a site, let's say this is your backyard. Let's say this is your site. And in fact, I'll do my current site because I had to get that site. So in my current uh, project, the house looks like that. That's the driveway. That's the front door to the house. So the council, as part of my development application, made me get a soil test. So what they said is you need to test the rear yard. So they made me do a borehole there, a borehole there, and a borehole there. So what they do is they just take a random sample. So they won't, they would never do three boreholes right there. They'll just take them from random locations. So needless to say, the soil testing engineer came in, came with a big corkscrew, basically wound down. And so they go like a metre, two metres, three metres down on the ground. The council will specify how far they to go down. So they just keep drilling, 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 drilling with a, like, a, like a big pin sort of thing. It collects a... Um, they come up when they lift it back up again. A clump of dirt will come up. They'll put that into a glass vial and basically that gets sent away to the laboratory. The laboratory will analyse the composition of material and they'll work out whether it's got, you know, human carcinogens, leads, toxic stuff, whatever it may be, what's in it. If it fails, the reading, like if, it's, if the soil is contaminated past an acceptable level, they will make you do what's called site remediation. Remediation is where you need to come and strip out all of the soil. So you don't need to take out all the soil. Depending on how bad the contamination is, they may make you go. They, they may make you shave off a hundred mil from the top level of the site. They may make you come and take out three meters down. So it just depends on how uh, contaminated. So be very careful with that because if you're buying, particularly a lot of developers get tripped up on this when they're doing urban renewal areas. Um, you know, they'll come in and they'll have to basically take out all of the soil back down to the natural rock. 
Okay, so just be very careful on that question. Would you also use a uh, structural engineer for, um, uh, sorry, soil testing engineer for strength of like um, weight bearing? Yes, for foundations. For foundations yeah. Absolutely. Your structural engineer um, primarily looks at that as well, but sometimes it's an unknown to them, so that's where you'd bring the soil testing engineer. They'll drill down, they'll find out what your building is actually built on, whether it's clay, shale, whatever, sand, whatever it may be, and that can help the structural engineer determine what they need designed to make sure the house is not going to move in any way, shape or form. Sheree. Yep. If you're actually buying in an area like in a city where you know there's a lot of contamination, yes. would it not be more sensible to have a test done before you actually purchase the property? Yeah, absolutely, if you want to go that expense. But the reality is you're probably looking at $1,000. So you might just, for your peace of mind, for your peace... Uh, you could do that. You could subject to contamination testing if you wanted to. Um, and that just depends. For you, your, your sleep, at fa uh, sleep at night factor might be a due diligence cost of $1,000 to make sure you're not in for a 20 grand expense somewhere down the track. So um, be conscious of this in inner city when you're renovating places in the inner city locations more prevalently or make sure you're aware of this when you're dealing with even those outer metropolitan areas where there has been a formal industrial commercial use of some sort. It can be, you know, just um, a company, a small paint company tipping some paint, some turps into the ground at one point that can contaminate your site. So I don't think it has to be masses of, you know, nuclear waste coming from, you know, Springfield. It doesn't have to be anything like that. What, oft, what oft, often happened too is in the old, um, like in days gone by, a lot of imported material got brought into the harbour here in Sydney and, and also all around the other states of Australia as well. So these large ships came in with all this toxic waste and they dumped it on basically all the, the peninsula suburbs. So a lot of contamination in inner city water, particularly where there's water. Um, those peninsula subjects can be highly contaminated sites. Now, if your site is contaminated, you will be required to remediate. As I said, there is a tag and testing process. So if anybody has got renovation sites that are contaminated, certainly phone the office. I'm more than happy to talk this through because I could basically teach you this for two hours just on contamination alone. A site auditor will need to come out to your site and verify that you've basically cleaned it up. Um, contamination is very expensive. Um, it's not actually the contamination, it's actually the remediation that's very expensive with the cartage of the uh, toxic fill and so forth. And then it's the consultants to come back and check to make sure you've actually done the right thing and dispose of it. So it can be, you know, expect 10, 20, 30, 50,000. Um, the heritage site that I sold, I knew it was contaminated again, another contaminated site that had to be taken right back down to the sandstone. And the, the builder that bought it off me, who um, we, we knew those costs as part of him buying that land, was 75,000. So we knew that before we bought the site. So yeah, that can be expensive. Okay, private certifier. As part of your construction certificate, uh, construction certificate is just um, nicknamed CC. So start talking, talking the terminology of professional renovators. So when you're doing a CC application, what you'll also need to do is appoint a pr private certifier. Now you have two options in this regard as renovators. You can either use the council to be your certifier or you can use the private certifier. When you actually start construction, there are a number of compliance inspections, which means when the council officer comes out or the private certifier, when you get to certain stages, they have to come and inspect the slab before you pour the concrete to make sure you've formed it all up correctly. And then when your walls go up, and your roof go up, they'll make you do another uh, compliance inspection. So there's all different stages. All councils have different things in every single um, council. But in my council, for example, they make you do one at site set out. So when you do your site set out, they'll check that to make sure you've actually pegged it out properly to make sure you're not going that extra half a metre over. And then when you form up your slab and your structural um, or your form workers come and lay all the steel before the concrete trucks are allowed to come in, a council inspector comes out again, make sure you've put all the structural. So what they'll do is a council inspector will come and get those structural engineering drawings. That, let's say these are the structural engineering, in, engineering drawings. The certifier or the council will come out. They'll stand with the drawings and they'll go, yep, you've done that. Yep, yep. Sheree, you've forgotten your ant capping over here, all right? So um, you need to make sure this ant capping goes on before that slab can be put. Um, why are you missing your termite protection there, Sheree? Okay, you've done that, you've done that. Good, good, good. Yep, no problems. So they fill out their tick, 
They've got a pass or a fail box at the bottom. They pass it. You always want to aim for a pass. When you've got that tick, it means you can come in and pour your slab. So they do that at various stages right throughout the project. So they, yeah, as I said, site set out, framing, uh, concrete slab framing, um, roof, there's normally one, there's one at waterproofing, there's a couple of others, and then right at the very end is your final occupation certificate, which is your final inspection to make sure it's a habitable home. So you can either get council to, so they're called building compliance inspections, you can get council to do that, or you can get a private, private certifier. Now in my experience as a professional renovator, it's probably best you bypass council and you go straight to the private certifier. Reason being is that the private certifier is more likely to be a lot quicker than what council will be. As a renovator, we know that time is money, right? Every day counts. So you don't want to be delayed waiting three, four, five days for council to come out when you can ring a certifier and they'll be there either that afternoon or the next day in most cases. So always go private certifier. The cost structure is exactly the same. Sometimes they can be a little bit more expensive, but we're talking marginal dollars. They might be like $10, $20, $50, not much expense whatsoever. Okay. Now there's lots of notes in your manuals. Before we actually get into the how you do the development application process, um, just in terms of where you get your design inspiration, there's lots of places you can do this. First of all, you can do the renovation TV shows. What show are you all gonna start watching now? Lifestyle Home Channel, only because I'm on it. So, um, um, yeah, it's got some fantastic, like, as I said, we have that going in our office Monday to Friday. And, you know, even still now, I glean some, when I'm, you know, capturing, capturing glimpses of the TV, um, you still get some really good ideas. So, you know, copy, copy, copy other people's ideas. Interior Design Magazine, so start subscribing to some of those really good magazines like um, Contemporary Home, uh, there's lots of them. Go into the news agency, buy a whole stack of them and familiarise yourself with them. Um, interior designer websites often have gallery, section, gallery sections in their websites. Sorry, Jules, or one of the crew, Pillar, could I get um, you to grab my design inspiration folder, please, just from over here? Um, so interior designer websites can be absolutely great in their gallery sections. If you like something that attracts you emotionally, the wow factor, print it out and stick it into your design folder, which I'll show you in a section. Um, open for inspections. Open for inspections are a great way to look at other people's house and you know a lot of people renovate their house. So if you see something that buyers are like, Basically do that in your project. Kitchen and bathroom showrooms, absolutely great for design inspiration and also display homes as well. So just copy, copy, copy absolutely everybody else. A lot of interior designers do that as well. Have the interior designers down here, would you say that's true? Absolutely. You just, you're not all, the reality is they're not all creative geniuses, just good at copying what other people do. That happens a lot. Okay, I will show you what I do in terms of my design inspiration. So don't try and overdevelop your site, okay? Because what you want to aim for as renovators is your development applications to go through as quickly as possible with as minimal fuss and how and less than how many objections? Four or less objections means it's going to go through quickly. If you do have more than four objections, then what will happen is you will have to go to a public ward meeting. That's that Jerry Springer show that I spoke about yesterday. So definitely try and go to one of those just for educational learning, even if it isn't in your own area. And like our council is particularly good council for those ward meetings just to get a really good gist of, um, of when, you know, when those sorts of things are on. What I started doing in my very early days in terms of design inspiration is I actually set up these folders. So they're a bit um, long in the tooth now. I certainly don't do these. these now I look at these pictures, I think, geez, they're horrible pictures. But at the time, they look good to me. Um, so what I did is I actually just cut out pictures from a magazine. So I did one for kitchens, one for bathrooms, one for bedrooms, one for living rooms, and one for external gardens and front facades. So whenever I just, you know, because you're going to come, you're going to start reading lots of materials as property developers. Um, anything that appeals to you, just cut out the picture, put it in so that when it comes time to you trying to work out what you want to do with your reno, if you haven't developed your own cookie cutter template, then you can actually just go back and go, oh, you know what, I really like that little feature, how they did that. That, maybe I might do that. So really easy to do. So I'll pass that around. All right. What happens is that when you start with the architectural process, um, your architect needs to do due diligence as well. As we do for property developers, your architect will have to do due diligence as well. So as I said, they look at lots of things. They look at high control, side setbacks, all sorts of things. So you don't, as renovators, 
Don't stress yourself out having to know what all those things are. You're paying your experts to know that for you. It's the same way. One of the ladies in the audience uh, asked me about the, the lawyer. Who was the person who asked me about the legal due diligence um, in the break? Somebody. So I said to her, yeah. So I said to her, look, you know what? Of course, you've got to exchange a contract when you're buying a property, but you don't need to know all the ins and outs of the legal system. You, this is why it's really important to get a good property lawyer, a good property accountant, a good architect, because they will basically do everything. So I still, even to this day, don't know all the ins and outs of the legal system, but I don't have to. My time is best knowing and spending my time knowing about the stuff that's really going to matter to me. All right, so there's, there's a um, couple, just in your manuals, you've got a couple of slides there in terms of what are the things that, the primary things that an architect looks at, so, you know, streetscape, floor to space ratio, site coverage, boundary setbacks, landscaping, um, all sorts of things. Okay. Now, in my experience, what you're going to do is this. When you're starting the development application process, what you want to aim for is to try, before you actually lodge that development application, I need you to basically sit there and look at your architectural drawings in thorough detail on a room by room basis. Try and get them as perfect as possible before you lodge that application in council. Because the reality is, is if you have to change it somewhere along the line, i.e. a section 96 application, it actually means that you have to then resubmit a whole new construction certificate application. So it's double the paperwork. So a lot of people, the architect draws their plans and they go, yeah, yep, it's all good, yep, I like it. And then when they start the construction process, they go, oh, why did they put that door there? It should have actually been there. We should have changed that in the architectural process. So really have a good look at your plans, like really study them, get people's opinion. You know, certainly your graduate support managers at Renovating for Profit are more than happy to look over your floor plans any day of the week just for a second opinion. So I do a lot of that this, these days. Um, so look over them and try and get them as finalised as possible because what you want to aim for is no changes during the um, construction process, okay? Because it will be double the work. When you resubmit a new construction application, um, sorry, a Section 96 application, it's half the DA fees all over again. So with most councils, for example, I lodge applications where my construction cost is, you know, 300 to 400,000 on average, and my development application fees are normally around $2,000. So if I lodge a change via a Section 96 application, I'm paying $1,000 lost profit straight off the bat. So try and, try and get your di diagrams perfect before you lodge. That just requires you to look at every single room, look at the, where the windows are located, where the doors are located, all sorts of things. Okay, a quick question. Number 96, is that a variation form, is it? Section 96, I'm yeah. going to come through that now. Section 96, a change. All right, there's, um, there's a, uh, now I've said to you this weekend, there's two types of development applications. There's a partial development application. There is a full-blown development application. The partial development application is what's called complying development. Now, unfortunately, the terminology is a bit loose right across the whole country. Sometimes it's called exempt and complying development. Sometimes it's just called complying development. All right. So if you hear those words, it means the same thing. It's just called different things. What um, what exempt and complying development is great for is minor changes. So for example, if you had a back back um, that back room, let's say the back of your house and you as a structural renovator want to come in and you want to open up the back so your backyard, your house flows onto the courtyard or the backyard, you might be taking that little security door, which you know those old houses always have those just normal doors right at the very back. You want to come in as a structural renovator and basically increase that door to door. Now some councils will make you, so you want to basically make a much bigger opening to let all that natural light and ventilation through the rear of the property. Now in a lot of councils, because that's considered, and that might be the only change you're making to the whole property, some councils will allow you to lodge that, that change under a complying development application, which is basically 10 days or less for approval. So it's great for you as renovators because you don't have to go through the whole council approval process, which could be potentially months. And um, what it also means is that you're going to have a lot less DA. So it's very minimal fees to actually lodge a complying development application. The beautiful thing about a complying development application too is that your neighbours don't get notified. 
okay? So you don't have all those potential objections that could come in. So always find out when you're going to your architect or your draftsman, ask them straight up, is this an application that I could get under complying development? Uh, when we bring Melissa up, I may bring Melissa up right now. Um, when we bring Melissa, the architect, up, we'll certainly ask her some questions. Um, so there is also now a new... Um, there's, there's two types of complying development applications. There's obviously the one through your local council where uh, you can get minor changes. Remember yesterday I told you about the house, that patchwork house, where I basically was able to knock down the whole house I rebuilt it like for like and I was able to get that under complying development application in 10 days or less. So that's a classic example. Melissa, welcome. So this is Melissa Treadgold, everybody, local architect and city. It's um, Melissa's first time on stage as well, so um, <laughs> we're going to be good, all right, <laughs> um, on our best behaviour. So um, Melissa's, uh, we've brought Melissa in today just to um, help with architectural questions, um, particularly in the planning. Uh, obviously, you're a lot more expert at what I don't claim to be an architect. Any day, I'm far from it, and I'm not an expert in the planning controls. So we brought Melissa in to answer any questions that you may have. So in terms of the two types of complying development, you've obviously got standard complying development, and uh, you've told me this morning that you've also got this, this different type of complying development called the CDC? Um, the new complying development, um, it's a CDC, Complying Development Certificate. It is not a council um, certificate. It's a state, New South Wales state government policy which overrides the DA. You can do quite major developments with it. It's a 10-day approval period, no notification to neighbours, which will save you a long time, months. Um, and is that for particular, la a particular sites, a minimum size? Yes, that you have to consider the, your site size, um, the position of your car parking, it has to be behind the building line, so that often rules out older houses because there's no um, car parking access. Uh, setbacks, height, um, landscaped area, floor area and site coverage, but they're not looking at the aesthetics of the building. They're really looking at the bulk of the building and how much landscaping. It's a bit of a number crunching exercise. However, it's always a good idea to um, be mindful of your neighbours mm -hmm. because you can cop a bit of flack from them. You do have to notify them within that you're going to start building in 48 hours' time, which is, <laughs> which is quite dramatic in some stage. Yeah. And it's not suitable in a conservation area and in certain zonings where you might have um, bush be affected by a bushfire situation or a floodplain, you can't do any of that. So you've got to check your zoning first. That's it. That's the first thing you have to check if you want to do that compliant development. Otherwise, you've got to go down the DA yep. path. All right, so the question is, when you go to your architect or your draftsman, one of the first questions that I would be asking them as professional renovators and developers would be, can I get my application under complying the local complying development or the CDC, which is the state complying development application? So obviously the two are very similar in their attributes. There's obviously some minor details there. Mm. Um, I don't expect, I'm certainly not an expert in it, I don't expect you to be an expert, but your architect will know which path you can go down. Is that correct, That's right. Melissa? I can okay, recommend great. The so just make suitable process for yeah. you. So yeah. just make sure you ask that question first. Can I? Because if you can get it down that complying development application rather than a full-blown DA, DA, it's a good day for you as renovators. That's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, we'll have quick questions. Is it just New South Wales? Or is it the whole uh, that's just New South Wales that I know of. You could check the other states, but I only work in New yeah, South Wales. Yeah, I, so. I believe that, I mean, I yeah. have heard something similar. I actually didn't realise it had come into effect, but I heard that it was going to be a nationwide policy. So just go back to your local architect, your local draftsman, and ask whether that option is available in your local council, because every council in Australia is different. Okay. Hi, I'm just doing this at the moment, and it actually um, did say on my Section 149 certificate that it um, could be done as a compliant development. Yeah, well, that's what you need to do, get a 149. Um, it was in the sale contract. Yeah, well, that would be fine. Yeah. Good. Yes? Uh, hi, yeah. You said it wasn't applicable in certain suburbs, um, conservation suburbs. Is that 
rule out the likes of Balmain and Rosa? Well, it's not necessarily the whole suburb. There, there's conservation areas within suburbs. Some, like in Willoughby, there's you know sort of ten areas, so that there would be a conservation area. You can't do a CDC in a conservation area, but in the rest of the suburb, you, it's yeah. it's so as a whole. Fine. Um, in the foreshore area of Balmain, yeah. that'd be classed as a conservation area. So yeah. you think you'd be you can done still, by? you can still, you can still. I mean, I've done complying development in Balmain, so I think in Balmain you'll you'll still be going down the complying development application process. Um, it doesn't matter the whole. You can still, so you can still do complying. Your answer is you can still do complying development applications in heritage and conservation where uh, conservation areas where there's conservation blankets. Yes, you can still do that. I, we don't know whether or not you can do it under the state complying. You can certainly do it under the local complying, but we're not sure about the state. Would that be correct to say? Yes, that's right. But there are certain suburbs where um, I'm just working on something in North Sydney at the moment, and it's a minor change to a building, but because it is in a conservation area, it's got to be a DA, unfortunately. Yep. All right, so these are the steps in terms of now lodging your development application, we're going to go through what the basic high-level steps are, OK? All right, the first step is a pre-development assessment. Do you want to have a chat about that, Melissa? Pre-development, yes, it's normally a good idea, especially if it's a contentious issue. I don't always have a pre-DA meeting with council. However, it would be advisable. So I'll just back step from there. So what yep. a pre-DA is, because most, most of the guys here don't okay. know what a pre-DA is. Do you want to explain? Or? Well, once you've got some indication you can do this you could actually do it before you purchase the property too you could have some sketches drawn up by the architect um, you could both go to meet a planner at council and go through what your proposal is and they can assess it verbally against their controls and give you a reasonable idea of um, whether it could be successful and what issues you have to deal with that, that wouldn't be compliant so that could be a problem for you but yep. it's a good process to go through definitely okay cool so what it is it's yeah it's just basically high level concept sketches where an architect or draftsman will just basically draw up you can go to an architect or like a particularly a draftsman you can go to a draftsman and get high level concept drawings done for under a thousand dollars very high level um, and basically what you do is you take those concepts, they get lodged in a formal application called a pre-development application. So at the back of your manuals, there is an, I've included all the checklist from my council. Um, you'll find that your own councils are similar, but just cite variances according to your own council. So familiarise yourself with all little things on each of those checklists. But you take that in, you lodge it to council, and then they will give you a formal assessment whether they're likely to support that application. So that it is a... Um, it is a formal assessment. They will never tell you, yes, it's a done deal. It'll always be grey. They'll say, yes, you know, this has got a good chance. It complies with this, this and this. They'll never say, you've got a great chance. I'll never say that. But where, mm. where um, pre -DAs are really good, I'll give you an example. On one of my students' um, projects, he had a, a site where it was just a normal residential house. And so it was, just, it was here in Annandale. So on a normal block... And the house was sort of sitting like that. Now, with this house, he had potential to do either a bigger structural renovation. He could have come out here and sort of gone out like that. Or the site offered the potential to actually carve it right up the middle and actually just build another dwelling through here. So he actually had two options on the site. So what he did is he got a pre-DA and he actually submitted two pre-DAs, one for a subdivision application with construction of a new dwelling and then obviously the other one was uh, alterations and additions to the existing dwelling. So he lodged the two pre-development applications. Uh, council said there's no way on earth we're going to support that subdivision so it was bumped on the head and the other one they said yes we would support this you would just need to consider this you need to make sure that um, your ridge line was you know below in matching the next door neighbours whatever it may be there's all the little conditions. So when you get that pre-DA when you get the formal assessment from the pre-DA what it does for enough architect, it actually then guides them as to what council want for your full-blown DA. So when you're doing a pre-DA, you still have to go through the formal development application process. It's just a meeting with them to basically get an indication of what they're likely to support and what they're not, so that you don't go off on a tangent with your architect and create something that they're never going to support in the first place. 
When you do a pre-DA, it also makes your DA go through quicker. Is that your experience, Melissa? They, can, they do encourage you to do a pre-DA, yep. but also beware that the person who is doing that pre-DA assessment is not necessarily the person who will be doing the DA yes. assessment, and there could be a difference of opinions. Yes. Um, so that's a bit of a problem yep. sometimes. Yeah, that's right. And so um, I think in most cases they do like to, in an ideal world, council do like to, whoever assesses the, the pre person, yeah, they just naturally pass it on so they're already familiar with it. Yeah. But there are definitely some chances where, you know, people change stuff, change um, things happen. All right, you then got the design. So once you do your pre-development analysis, now you don't have to do that, guys. Um, what you might want to do is you might come across an unrenovated house, let's say a deceased estate that's going to auction in four weeks' time. As renovators, you go through the open for inspection on day one. And you see this little underutilised house sitting on a block like that, and you're thinking you might want to do a structural renovation, but it's in a heritage area, Balmain, whatever it may be, and you're not quite sure if you're allowed to do what you wanted to do. So what I would do it. So if I want to get 100% uh, assurance of what I can do there, on that very first open for inspection, I would go straight to my draftsman or my architect. I'd say, can you please knock up some high level concept drawings that I can lodge a pre -DA in council? I'd get a pre -DA lodged a couple of days later on that property. I would lodge it in council, typically give you an answer back in 14 days, 21 days at the absolute most, tends to be most councils, so that when auction day comes in week four, I can, go to count, I can go to that auction knowing full well whether I've got a good chance I can get an alteration addition on that structural renovation. So I don't go and buy a property at auction hoping, praying I can do something to, and then I buy it and then suddenly find out they're not going to support an alteration addition to what I'm hoping to get on the site. That's where a pre-DA is useful for you as renovators. That's right. Okay. Okay, second stage. So once you've done your pre-DA, so you don't have to do that. You can just go straight into a development application if you want. But if you don't want to do that, then straight into your DA. So do you want to have a talk about D, what, what you do when you lodge a DA in terms of the design and lodgement? Design and lodgement, okay. The DA is quite, there's a lot of documentation. There's the architect's drawings, which you've you talked about before. So the architect's drawings, there's also written documents like a statement of environmental effects, you need your basic certificate, um, often a heritage impact statement which can either be done by a consultant, sometimes architects do it if it's, yep. if it's only something brief, they can do it for you. Um, the, checklist, the application form, the checklists have to be filled out correctly. Um, you can work out fees via their websites normally if you're a genius, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can work it out. Yep. Um, but the important thing is what you were saying before, the DA, make sure you are happy with your DA. Really be so confident that that's really what you want to do because you really don't want any more changes. Yep. Okay, and, cool. and compliance with um, planning instruments too. All right. To get through quickly. Okay, cool. So where you start as renovators is obviously you're going to have a property that you need to get something built on. So the first part of the process in terms of the design is you go straight to an architect or a draftsman and you need to brief the architect or draftsman what you're hoping to accomplish. Now as renovators, you don't want to be going there and just saying, I want to create a home. I'd hope that through your due diligence, you'd know that you'd need to convert a two or three bedroom home to a four or five. So if you know that's what you need to do to get that resale price, you need to go to your architect and you need to say, Melissa, it's currently a three-bedroom home. I need to make this into a five-bedroom, two-bathroom home and ideally with off-street parking. So that, Melissa, you need to give them a fairly, a fairly good brief um, as to what you need to accomplish on the site. And then the challenge is for Melissa to go away and design something that's going to look nice and actually achieve that brief as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yep, beautiful. Absolutely correct. Um, I have included a copy of an architectural brief in your manuals as well. So there's just something there that you don't have to recreate the will. I am going to be developing a whole stack of new templates for section six, um, all the construction certificate templates. I will be, I'm actually going away overseas in two weeks time. I'm locking myself in a hut. I'm not taking my mobile phone and I'm developing a whole stack of new uh, content and, and stuff. So you will be definitely getting some more templates, CC templates and 
stuff in this regard so you can actually do a lot of this yourself. Obviously you can't replace the architect and we'll never replace you <laughs> but um, what fun. we can sort of minimise is some of the CC work um, which these guys can also help with. Alright, so the architect designs the scheme, okay, once you're happy, so make sure you check. Guys, try and not waste too much time in this regard. You know what, a lot of people sit, I mean, what's the average time from the time your clients actually start to the time they get finalised drawing, what's the average time? Well, it's, there's a huge variation actually, because yep. um, it can be held up with clients, with council. Um, just for the design process, not uh, putting aside before it even gets lodged in council. From the time somebody briefs you start drawing to the time they're happy to lodge them, what's the average lead time? I, I reckon a good guess. Three months? Yeah, three months, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. um, now, as renovators, what's your lead time? <laughs> Two weeks. Okay. So I've said to these guys that when they sign a contract... They need to organise a surveyor, which takes about a week, and then they literally need to brief their architect that they need to turn around their DA drawing. So these guys need to make quick decisions, basically keep the changes happening. So how would you feel if guys, uh, so like professional renovators came to you and said, Melissa, I'm in the business of, I've now I'm a, just set up a property development company. I want to be buying and selling properties for a profit. I'm looking at doing structural renovations. When I do get my projects going, when I do sign a contract, as an, I'd like to work with you long term over and over again so we know how each other works. Um, when I do have a project that I acquire, is it possible for you to turn my development application around within a couple of weeks if I promise to get back to you on time and be as quick as possible from my end? Could you potentially do that for me? <laughs> It'd be difficult. Really? Mm. Okay, so what's your average lead time? For professionals, like we're not, but these aren't mum and dad investors. Yeah, no, you could do it in two weeks. If, if you were geared up prior, prior to the actual purchase date, yep. that would be ideal. If you had something, if you'd made the connection with, with the client prior, yep. you could... Yeah, you could do it in two And that's what I said, yes. Yeah. You remember I said at the very beginning of this workshop, you need to start fostering these relationships with your architects. Don't let... So Melissa's made a very good point. She said, if the contact has been made beforehand, you don't want to just rock up willy-nilly Cherie saying, hi, I'm Cherie, um, do my DA in two mm -hmm. weeks. So you've already planted yeah. the seed that when you do get your property, you need Melissa to rock and roll. I've been working for one client for a year now. I'm looking at properties and doing sketch plans. Yep on about 10 different properties. So they recently bought one, so we're ready ready to go. We yep. know the process, it's um, heritage listed. Yep. Um, we've just been working with them, looking at properties down in the rocks. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to go now. So I've fostered that um, relationship. We've got all the other consultants ready to go. So mm -hmm. that's going to work out for them really well. Okay, cool. Yep. All right, so I need you as renovators to basically, that's your timeline for DAs, two weeks, okay? Ideally, don't just, please don't let it drag, don't let two weeks become a month or two months. I see it happen all the time, okay? So time is money. Okay, so you design, you design the architectural drawings, you <laughs> off trot to council with a big package, so normally your architectural package will include what size drawings? I always work on A3, which is really the preferred size, councils don't like those big drawings anymore so yep. working on a3 size so they they want usually about six sets so that could be six sets of um six drawings um six sets of the basic certificate your statement environmental effects your heritage photographs surveys so it's you know Several kilos it's of a, paper. Yeah, it's a yeah. big... Normally they wrap them in plastic. <laughs> it's a bit, so <laughs> Melissa will trot off to the council with a big package. And yeah. what they do is they ask for success because in what they do is when you lodge a development application, they disperse it to all the individual departments within the council. So one whole set of all the documents will go to the heritage, one will go mm, to the... Landscaping. Where, well, landscaping department, engineering. So just say they make you do that so they don't have to photocopy it themselves. So fair enough. So you're just going to take a big package and then it formally gets lodged. You pay your your development application fee over the counter. So you can do this or you can get your architect to do this either way. I just tend to do this myself. Um, and then it basically goes into council. Now when it goes into council, council will do an initial check over your development application. They're never going to notify councils for something that is never going to fly. So if you're putting a McMansion on a, a suburb where there's tiny little semis, they're never going to send that out for notification because what will happen if they do that? The neighbours are going to get it in their mail and they're going to go, 
what is this? And it's going to cause outrage. So they don't ever, they, they do a preliminary assessment on it before it gets notified to the neighbours. Is that correct? That's right. That's okay, cool. It goes for about a week before they notify. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so then what happens is once the council okay, it looks okay. They don't look at it in detail. They just look at it from a high level perspective. Once they know it's okay, then what they do is they notify the neighbours. So who here has ever got a letter in the mail from council saying that such and such Joe across the road is going to be doing alteration additions? Okay, great. So what they typically do in a lot of council, every council is indifferent. Just in my council, what they do is they send, basically my house is here. What they'll do is they'll send um, the full development application, like a copy of the plans. They'll send a letter saying, um, this letter is to advise you that, uh, you know, 48 Smith Street has submitted a development application for alterations and additions. Please find and attach a copy of the plans. If you would like to write a letter of rejection, um, please send it to here. If you would like to support it, please send a letter here. That's pretty much the gist of it. And what they do is, um, quite often, if this is my plot here, they'll send it to six neighbours that way, six neighbours that way, ten neighbours that way, and basically like the ten neighbours on the other side. So like it's just the numbers it's are different arbitrary. on every... Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. They, they, they notify all the neighbours to that side, to that side, across the road and behind you. They basically work out any house that could have a potential impact, you've got to notify them. Because if something, a development goes up and you don't know about it, then they can be sued because people can then claim loss of amenity, loss of privacy, basically end of their life. So that's reality. Mm. So they, do, they always are on the side of caution. So quite often for one development application, they could be posting out hundreds of letters um, depending on what type of development it is. Okay, so they get notified with um, neighbours. Have you ever seen some signs hanging on people's fence saying development application? That's basically that person is in the notification period. So as mm. renovators, your development application will get notified and it typically a sign or some sort of a notification will sit on that property for a period of, is it average 14 days yes, to 30 14, days? 14. 14 days, oh, great. Yeah. So 14 days. Now during that 14 days, anybody has the opportunity to write a letter of complaint or a letter of support. Hardly anybody writes letters of support. It's always letters of complaint. That's the reality. So be smart about your development applications. Uh, you might think this is a crazy idea, but on one of my uh, development applications, I tell this story in my preliminary stage presentations. The, I don't know if most of you remember, you know, the horror house um, where I got taken to court. Um, I got 47 letters of, of objection on one development application. So that was a bad day, right? But <laughs> what I did is I actually wrote 48 letters of support. Um, and I basically just, I created a template and, uh, <laughs> and I just got everybody to sign it and I submitted it. So even though it same, sounds crazy, I was just playing a game where, yes, I got 47 letters of rejection, but on the development application I actually said 48 letters of support. Some of those letters I signed from the cat. So it just, you know. <laughs> They recognise it, and I ended up getting it approved, but I wouldn't say solely because of the cat, but, um, <laughs> you know, it is a game. It's just who plays. It was a stupid thing, but, I, you know, it got recognised as 48 level letters of support. I actually made the paper for that reason too. So, um, and I was going to say, you'd be surprised who objects to your development too. Absolutely. Your next door neighbour who you might have, you know, drinks with every Friday night and feeds yep. your cat and everything, you're all right, 50-page objection. Yeah. It's... So don't trust anybody. Yeah. So yes. Um, they will object. The question yeah. is, do you notify your neighbours or don't you notify your neighbours? And I would say yes, notify your neighbours. I wouldn't go into all the ins and outs mm -hmm. with your neighbours, but I, what I would say, what you want your want neighbours to feel like is that you've given them at least some chance to have some sort of input and you want to recognise, you want to basically convey the message to them, look, I understand your concerns and we'll certainly take that into consideration with in the architectural planning, I will raise that with my architect so that so you don't um, there's no impacts to you. So I'm not saying what I'm going to do, but what I'm saying is I will certainly address it with my architect and raise it so we can be conscious of that in the design. And you've got a much better chance of the neighbours not flogging you in the council pl planning process. So the um, the development application assessment. So once you lodge it, so I'll quick take a quick question there. If you're staying within the existing footprint. Are there different guidelines for when you need some of the engineers, like soil testing and yep. like internal walls, you don't, but um, if you're knocking down and building again, do you need to...? 
Yeah, so like any, any no yeah. walls that you're knocking down um, internally, like if they're load bearing, you'll need a structural engineer. Um, anything that, remember just if you're not disturbing the soil on the outside, that's typically a cosmetic renovation. We don't need yeah. soil testing. It's, it, only soil testing mm -hmm. is really when you're disturbing the land or moving it in some way, shape or form, or if it is known to be contaminated. So yeah, it's just, you will use some of those consultants depending on what particular works you're doing. All right, so they lodge, they notify the, um, they notify your neighbours. Okay, you can still object um, after the ex advertising expiry, to, uh, expiry time. A neighbour can still write a letter of rejection. So the time, do. the fourteen yeah. days is irrelevant. That can come in at like three quarters of the way through the process, and council will still count that. So don't think you know you missed out on that date. That's it. It's not like that. As renovators, you know when you do lodge your DAs, you know ring up council or jump online. You can actually see how many objections you've got as well. So whenever I'm in the advertising period, I ring every couple of days and say. And I hope and pray, how many applications, how many letters of rejection have I got? And hopefully they say, yeah, there's only, only, only still one, which is good. So just, you know, be on top of that. Okay, so the neighbours get notified, all the objections uh, come in, all the letters of support, and then council will basically determine basically whether or not you get that project approved or not. They will look at the number of objections and they will also assess all the development control. So this is where they come back to their DCP, LEP, and they come back and they make sure that your building complies for a whole heap of things. Mm -hmm. Have you got anything? They may ask for extra uh, information at that stage too, extra shadow diagrams perhaps, um, which is quite, quite common, yeah. Um, they may want to see some structural information at that stage. Um, so that can be, that can add to your time as well because they give you 14 days for additional information so you really have to respond quickly. So you have to still keep your professionals on hand to make sure that they're on the case. Yep. Um, because if they're assessing extra information, even though theoretically they have 40 days to approve it, mm. it's never 40 days. Mm. It just can drag on for a long time. So you've got to get, they ask for extra information, get on the case immediately. Quick turnaround Yep, it's the way to go. Okay, so cool. Otherwise it's excruciatingly painful. It is. <laughs> so yeah, when the council do request extra, extra document, just get onto us straight away, every day counts. All right, so they'll assess it. Um, so they do notify it and then they determine the application. So what council will do is they'll get the input from all the other various departments within the council, the heritage, the... Um, engineers. Engineers, who Landsca else? Landscape. Landscaping, who else? Um, hmm. Arborist, yeah, yeah, tree department. If it's a, like sites like, like suburbs like Pimble where it's highly dense, dense uh, traffic issue. Yeah, RTA, like uh, ATA, RTA issues yeah. and things. So they're just basically all the various departments within a council. They will get their input. Quite often they write a report, each of the departments write a report, and that's what feeds. So all these individual reports feed into the town planner who is assessing your application, and basically then that person makes a, an assessment, a determination whether or not it gets approved. Now, if um, you've got less than four objections and it complies and they say no issue, they'll stamp it approved. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean you can start work. If it gets rejected, then basically you have a right of repeal, um, a right to review that. It's called a Section 82A review, is that correct? Yes, although I've never needed to do one. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so Section 82, if your, your development application gets rejected, you do have a right to review that under a Section 82. So that's another form that you need to fill out and more documentation, okay? So there's, I don't think it's a dead duck at that point of well, time. There, may, there also may be a situation where you have an on-site meeting with the councillors and your neighbours yep. during this assessment process, or you might end up at, at the council meeting having to speak about the... Um, the proposal, you might have to bring in professionals then, you might need town planner and architect to come in and speak on your behalf at the council meeting as well. Sure. Yep. Okay. Now, if for some reason, so your plans get approved, okay? Now, if for some reason your plans have to change during the construction process, for example, you might be, uh, you know, in the middle of building your house and um, you're walking down the hallway and you think, why is that, why is the builder, or why is that doorway, why is that being positioned there, for example? So like you might be walking down, you know, a house and you've got your rooms and the door is right in the middle of the room and you suddenly realise, it's cutting my wardrobe, that's the wall, the wardrobe's got to go on. Why should they, why, they should have actually put the door over here and they were going to utilise that whole wall for a wardrobe. So you might want to just, a little change like that 
don't think you can just do that, even though it's internal and nobody's probably going to see it besides you and the builder and the tradies coming through. You might think, oh, look, I'll just make that change anyway. So you technically really can't make that change. That is really a Section 96 application because at the end of the construction, when the private certifier or the council, in council inspector is going to come through and check that you've actually built your house according to your construction plans, they could pick up little things like that and they'll say, this is actually, this doorway's in the wrong position. Um, it should have been over there. Is there any particular reason why you've done that? Now, most councils will overlook that if it's minor, but like other changes, they may not be as easy going as that. So if you do need to make a change to your construction drawings, that is called a Section 96. You have to update your architectural plans. Mm -hmm. You have to lodge a Section 96 form, which is in the back of your manual, um, and, and pay fees. And fees. And Half the fees. There's also a notification period, and they could... It could be a stop work situation too. Yeah, so they so know that. So you basically delay. undergo the whole development application process to start with. And that's why I'm saying if you can get those construction mm. drawings right before you lodge them, it's going to minimise that expense and those delays on your project. Okay, when your project gets approved by council, at that under I'm actually not going to take any more questions if that's okay because I'm just over time. When you actually uh, get um, your, your development application approved, you then have to apply for what's called a construction certificate application. And that's your right to build the works according to the building code. So the council say, yep, you can build, you're approved to build the scheme. Now your construction certificate application has to make sure that that building complies with the building code and the building regulations of Australia. Is there anything to add to that, Melissa? Construction certificate, well, fortunately construction certificates don't take too long, but you still have to be geared up and ready to go. Like you might, want to get a good start on your engineering plans um, even before you get your DA consent so that when you apply for your CC they're all ready to go. Yep. At least get a start on it. Yeah. The only yeah. thing is in my experience you've got to be careful with that because yeah. what happens is is that and I got tripped up on this in my mm. early days when you get a head start, because you'll naturally, they take two weeks, one to two weeks to get your structural and your hydraulic engineering drawings. But quite often, it's very rare that council will actually s uh, stamp you approved without making some conditions. They That's always right, yeah. take something away with what you want. So they might say, uh, Cherie, yep, we're going to approve your new alteration addition, but can you please just bring that left, that northern boundary in 200 mil on the, on the side um, to allow for better amenity for the next door mm -hmm. neighbour. Now, if you've got a head start, on your structural engineering drawings, guess what? They're going to have to change yep. because even just pulling in your house 200 mil on one side of the house changes the span of the walls and the calculations. So I always think it's best that not to start your structural, and I, I perfectly understand what you're saying, mm. but I think it's actually best not to start your structural and your hydraulic drawings until you've actually got the stamp and your updated amended drawings have been done according to your new conditions. So when, when, your, um, when the council issues your approval, what they'll do is they'll send you a set of development conditions. Um, it's not uncommon to get a 20-page letter with 300 points, is that fair to say? Yeah, most of them are just standard conditions about work hours and yeah, that's right. garbage bins and things like that. But there will may be some little specific conditions for your site. Absolutely. Which you have to read through very carefully to make sure you pick them all up. Yep. And you'll have to also, you have to give that document to the certifier mm -hmm. so that they know what they're actually certifying. And the other thing is that they may also need a uh, specification for the CC. Yep. Now, that document, um, the way I do it, it's, I've got it on computer and I just customise it for each project. Yep. So it doesn't really take that long to do it. Yep. But you'll probably, you'll need it anyway. Yeah, you will. Um, so it's a good idea to get that yep. sort of in the pipeline as well. Absolutely. Yep. All right, so you get, you get your development application, you get all your conditions, and what you have to do is when you get that 20-page document with conditions, you need to read through every single condition and you basically need to address it. So as um, Melissa said, a lot of them are standard says, you know that, you know, site work hours are 7.30, 7 till 5 p.m. All I do is I type up a summary document that says, um, condition 7, noted, condition 8, noted, condition 9, noted, um, condition 10, 
uh, 10, builders respond noted as per builder's responsibility. So they're not, um, don't freak out when you get those DA conditions. I actually am going to develop a template for that. In fact, I think some of you in your manuals may even have it at the moment, um, a copy of mine which says the C. I'm not sure if you've got it or not. If not, I'll email it to you in the next couple of days. But uh, just an example of how I address my construction certificate applications in terms of responding to the DA consents. Um, so you do that. And when you, as part of your CC, so that's when you get your structural engineering drawings, your hydraulic engineering, you'll have to do things like a site and waste management plan, which are all templates that will be coming for you. And you basically get, so to, in effect, you pull together another submission package, mm -hmm. not as exhaustive. When the council makes you make that change, they say pull in your building 200 mil on that one side, you have to go back to your architect or to Melissa and you need to say um, she'll need to update her final architectural yep. drawings. Yep. And then you give those updated drawings to your structural engineer, your hydraulic engineer, and then that's what you're going to start to build the house on. That takes, the CC process takes approximately one week through a pri private certifier. It can literally be done in a day or two in some cases with some certifiers. If you lodge it through council, it will take a week, one to two weeks. It can take a bit long when a lot of councils are sort of actively discouraging people for doing CC through council because they're basically... Yep, they don't want under, it. They're under-resourced. Yeah. So. so if you want to go yeah. the slow way, go through council. If you want the fast way, go through a certifier. Yep. Literally, yeah, I've, I've lodged CC applications. Um, like on a Wednesday afternoon, I've had approval Thursday afternoon to start work. So that's the beauty of working certifiers. They're fast. So once you've mm. actually been notified that you've got your construction certificate approved, as part of that, what they will do, um, your certifier will notify the council that you are going to start work. So you'll be required to fill out a form which you have in the back of your manuals. That's a little form. Quite often, like my council, it's bright orange. And why that form goes is that gets lodged into council and that council, that form saying you're about to start work, guess who that goes to? The rangers. All right, so the rangers have a hit list. They know where all their development applications are on the go and basically your name. So as soon as you say you're going to be starting work in, in two days, um, they basically, your name will go on that list. And look, they're not out there to police and control your life, but what they are there is to drive past your site and make sure you're not doing any dodgy building works, you're not doing anything um, from an environmental pollution. Like They make sure you've got your gates, mm. your sediment control, so mm. no dirty water is running off onto the street. That's their job to make sure that you are doing the right thing on your building sites. All right, and that's pretty much it. So that's it, and then you start the construction process. That's where you start step number seven, okay? So that's a very high level. Look, at the end of the day, I, I could do a two-day workshop just on council, but um, that is just the high-level process of you to understand the steps. And as I said, there will be more content coming from you in that regard. Does anybody have any questions from Melissa before she jumps off? No? Okay. Uh, one question here, Melissa. Yeah. You keep on talking about how we don't have to um, have any approval for internal changes. I recently went to dinner at a, a person's place in Redfern and he knocked the wall out between the two front rooms and he said the neighbour put him in and he got in trouble. And I was Structural. just... Structural? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was and, just curious. And yeah. also in a conservation area they are concerned about um, pulling walls down. I'm, I'm involved in something at the moment where they want to pull some walls out in the conservation area and, the, and we, we are allowed to demolish a certain part of the walls but, but not all of it because it's, uh, it's a heritage issue as well as... So do we have to have issue. approval or are we... What's the situation? If it's a structural wall, yeah, you should yeah, have anything um, structural, anything structural yeah. yeah. But that's a complying development. That's not a full-blown yeah. DA. Right, okay. Yeah, well, that's a it, partial. That's where you don't need to go. The you don't need to notify your neighbours. That's a I partial. Mean, if, if you have any basic um, queries about that sort of issue, really, you can just phone the council and explain what you're going to do and they'll, yeah, they'll give you a few you. guidelines or even a, a private certifier can help you too if you don't want to yep. get involved in the council at all. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. All right, thank you.